Hi, this is Shiva Raman. Uh, I'm from Johns Hopkins University in the Department of Radiology. And we're going to talk a little bit about computed tomography after pancreatic duodenectomy. We'll talk about normal findings and some complications that you should be looking out for. Now, complications of the Whipple procedure, we'll start a little bit by talking about the surgical procedure itself, including the anastomoses and uh, how the procedure is performed. We'll talk a little bit about CT technique, including how we typically image patients at Johns Hopkins who have had a prior Whipple procedure. And we'll talk a little bit about normal findings, uh, things that you shouldn't confuse with pathology, both in the acute perioperative period and when performing chronic surveillance. But we'll spend most of the lecture really going into a number of different complications that you might encounter when you're imaging these patients after they've undergone a Whipple. Now, the Whipple procedure, so-called pancreatic duodenectomy, is the most common procedure utilized today for resection of tumors in the pancreatic head, unsinate process, and neck, as well as for lesions that occur in the duodenum, I mean the duodenum, the extrahepatic bile duct, or in the ampulla. Now, for many, many years, the Whipple procedure was a dreaded surgery, right? Massive mortality, huge uh, morbidity, but honestly, there have been dramatic improvements both in surgical technique and critical care. On top of the fact that I think imaging has helped clinicians in terms of dealing with many of the complications of the procedure, and accordingly, perioperative mortality rates are now relatively low, under 1%, although there is still a quite significant uh, rate of complications. It is worth noting that your rate of complication and your rate of mortality are much lower if you undergo the procedure at a major center that does many, many of these procedures every year. Now, when you're talking about a Whipple procedure, there's really two types you should be familiar with. There's the classic Whipple, which entails resecting the pancreatic head, neck, and unslit process, as well as the duodenum, the gallbladder, the distal bile duct, and the proximal jejunum, and you remove the gastric antrum. And then there's the so-called pylorus preserving procedure, a Whipple procedure, where you resect all of the stuff I talked about earlier, but you retain the gastric antrum and the first portion of the duodenum. In a classic Whipple procedure, you're going to have a gastrojejunostomy, whereas in a pylorus preserving pr procedure, you're typically going to have a duodenojejunostomy. Now, the pylorus preserving procedure was originally intended to reduce the risk of bile reflux, but there's a lot of data in the literature suggesting that there's really not a lot of difference in terms of patient outcomes when you undergo the classic or the pylorus preserving Whipple. And honestly, at Hopkins, at least from what I've seen, a lot of whether or not you get the classic or the pylorus preserving Whipple is going to be based on your surgeon's preference and their own comfort level. Now, it is worth noting that the criteria for utilizing the Whipple procedure has dramatically expanded over the course of the last decade, right? In the old days, if you had pancreatic cancer and you wanted to get a resection, it essentially meant that you had to have no metastatic disease and no significant vascular involvement. But as we've developed this new category of borderline resectable pancreatic cancers, we've found that even patients with relatively significant vascular involvement by tumor are still potentially surgical candidates, and that, at least at Hopkins, has resulted in a dramatic increase in the volume of Whipple procedures that we're performing in our institution. Now, there are a number of innovations that have come with that increasing perform uh, in uh, increasing uh, performing the, increasingly performing the Whipple procedure, and that includes laparoscopic Whipples, which we have a few surgeons here at Hopkins who are doing those, as well as relatively complicated vascular reconstruction methods that make those Whipple procedures possible in patients who have tumoral involvement. So SMV and portal vein reconstructions, venous interposition grafts, splenic vein grafts, all of these are used uh, to facilitate the Whipple procedure in patients who have quite significant venous involvement by tumor. Now, as I mentioned before, the classic Whipple procedure is going to give you three, uh, three anastomoses, right? You're going to have the pancreatic jejunostomy, so the pancreatic remnant and the jejunum. You're going to have a biliary enteric anastomosis, which can be a hepatic jejunostomy or a cholidoca jejunostomy. And then you're going to have either a gastrojejunostomy in the classic Whipple, so an anastomosis between the stomach and the jejunum, or in a pylorus preserving Whipple procedure where you retain the gastric antrum and the proximal duodenum, you're going to have a duodenojejunostomy. And so those are the three anastomoses that you need to really look at carefully every time you evaluate one of these cases, right? Every case, I find the three anastomoses, hepatic OJ, pancreatic OJ, and either the gastro-J or the duodenojejunostomy, depending on the type of Whipple procedure the patient has had. Now, I'm a strong believer that anyone who's had a prior Whipple procedure 
needs to be imaged with dual phase technique. And that means arterial phase imaging typically at about 30 to 35 seconds after IV contrast, and a venous phase at typically 60 to 70 seconds after IV contrast. Now, I typically avoid giving positive oral contrast in this group of patients unless I'm concerned about a leak at the gastrojejunostomy. And the reason for that is that if you're really con looking at the pancreatic remnant and the surgical bed, you don't want contrast pooling in the stomach, potentially resulting in beam hardening artifact or streak artifact that might prevent you from identifying a local recurrence. The only time I give positive oral contrast is in the acute setting where I'm worried about some kind of a leak, usually at the gastrojejunostomy. Now, as I mentioned, the first thing to do anytime you're looking at one of these cases is to find the three anastomoses. The pancreatic ojejunostomy tends to be most obvious in the axial plane, and usually you're going to see the anastomosis somewhere near midline or maybe slightly to the right of midline, and immediately adjacent to the anastomosis, you're going to see a basically a number of loops of small bowel in the right upper quadrant extending upwards towards the hepaticojejunostomy. Now, it is not at all uncommon to identify this radio-dense uh, linear foreign body within the pancreatic duct extending across the anastomosis, as in this case, that's a pancreatic duct stent, which is increasingly used, being used by surgeons to minimize the risks of a pancreatic leak or a pancreatic fistula. Now, the hepaticojejunostomy tends to be most obvious in the coronal, uh, coronal plane, and so I always use my coronal MPRs to identify this particular anastomosis. In rare instances, as in this case, you're going to see a stent or traversing the anastomosis, but this is not at all common. And uh, typically, you're going to use gas within the biliary tree extending from the bile ducts into the jejunum as a way to trace this particular anastomosis. And then finally, the gastrojejunostomy is going to be visible either in the axial or the coronal plane. And uh, typically, it's going to be the easiest of the three anastomoses to identify. In this case, you can nicely see the anastomosis between the stomach and the adjacent jejunum. Now, I think it's important, especially if you're not used to looking at a lot of these cases. You know, in my case, I, you know, I look at post-operative Whipples pretty much every day, right? We do hundreds of Whipple resections here at Hopkins every year, so I see post-operative Whipple procedures all the time, and over time it becomes obvious what is normal post-operative change and what's actual pathology. But, you know, I work with residents and fellows who haven't seen a lot of these cases, and it can be very easy to mistake normal post-operative stuff from actual pathology. So what are you looking for? What's normal in the acute perioperative setting? Well, in the acute setting, it goes without saying that fluid, fat stranding, and edema surrounding the surgical bed are going to be common. There's almost always going to be induration surrounding the SMA and SMV. So in other words, stranding and so in density immediately posterior to the SMA and SMV, often quite crescentic in morphology. Usually, it's just postoperative change. You're going to often see multiple reactive lymph nodes in the central mesentery, usually sub-centimeter, but can rarely be larger. These are not metastatic. These are reactive lymph nodes as a result of the inflammation. Now, in the acute postoperative setting, thickening at the anastomoses is not at all uncommon, right? So you can see thickening of the gastrojejunostomy, and often there may be mild proximal dilatation of the stomach as a result. And you can also see that the pancreatic duct may be dilated as a result of in, probably as a result of edema at the pancreatic ojejunostomy. Those are common findings, and in most patients, they're just going to resolve over the course of time. Similarly, a little bit of biliary dilatation is not uncommon in the acute setting, again, probably as a result of edema at the hepatic ojejunostomy. So in most cases, as long as it's mild, you're just going to follow it over time, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you've got a recurrent tumor or that you've got a stricture at the anastomosis. Now, here's a normal postoperative case, right? None of this is concerning. There's stranding and edema. Notice this induration behind the SMA and the SMV. Notice the presence of the pancreatic duct stent. All of these findings are going to resolve over time. You don't need to worry about a leak. You don't need to worry about the possibility of recurrent tumor. The pancreatic duct stent, in some cases, can stay in, a, in the same place for months at a time, or in other patients, can migrate relatively rapidly into the bowel. It doesn't really matter. I just report where it is on my, uh, in my dictation. Now, in the chronic setting, that tends to be where people get into more trouble in that they mistake normal findings for tumor recurrence. Now, in most cases, the inflammatory stuff that I talked about earlier should resolve by about three to six months. So the induration in the surgical bed, the reactive lymphadenopathy, most of that is going to be gone 
either at their first follow-up or in their second follow-up by about six months. But the one finding that can stick around for a long period of time is this crescentic rind of soft tissue immediately posterior to the SMA and SMV. That is a classic location for postoperative fibrosis. I see it in nearly every patient that I look at. And it's the morphology that's going to help you differentiate this from tumor. It's going to be crescentic, linear, not mass-like. If you start seeing rounded soft tissue, nodular soft tissue, well, that's not likely to be fibrosis. You really have to worry more about recurrent tumor at that time. Now, in most cases, the pancreatic duct and the, common, and the biliary tree, that bili those, the dilation of the ducts is going to resolve your, you know, on your, one of your follow-up studies. But that being said, it is possible that you can have mild pancreatic and biliary ductal dilatation forever, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a stricture. What you do need to worry is if you see severe dilatation or if that dilatation is progressing over time. And in both cases, you need to worry about either anastomotic stricture at the hepatico jejunostomy or the pancreatico jejunostomy or recurrent tumor that's actually obstructing the duct. Now, thickening of the bowel is actually quite common, especially the right upper quadrant jejunum or thickening of the gastrojejunostomy. And in most cases, this isn't pathology. It doesn't mean that you have enteritis or ischemia. But it's usually because these patients are increasingly being treated with adjuvant radiation, either before or after their treatment. And these bowel loops end up getting included within the radiation port. And so they can look thickened for long, long periods of time. And that's not a pathologic finding. And for similar reasons, you can end up with geographic areas of steatosis in the left hepatic lobe as a result of radiation therapy that includes the left hepatic lobe within the radiation port. So now that we know what normal looks like, let's talk about some of the complications that you should be looking for and how exactly you can help guide the treatment of these complications. Now, by far, the most important complication that you need to be cognizant of is pancreatic fistula, which is a kind of fancy surgical term for a pancreatic leak. It represents breakdown either of the pancreatic or jejunal anastomosis or a site of surgical injury in the pancreatic parenchyma, resulting in leakage of amylase-rich pancreatic secretions from the pancreatic duct. Now, classically, this was a surgical, uh, clinical diagnosis, right? So they would look at the drain fluid amylase level, and if it was three times higher than the serum amylase on the third postoperative day, then the surgeons would say, by definition, this patient has a pancreatic fistula. Now, that is still, to this day, the way in which this diagnosis is made in most patients. But that being said, we are increasingly seeing findings on CT that can help suggest this diagnosis, and in many cases, we can make the diagnosis on a CT scan, and they can confirm the diagnosis looking at the drain fluid amylase levels. Now, this is a critical diagnosis to make. This is the single most important cause of morbidity and mortality after the Whipple procedure. I'm going to talk about a bunch of complications. This is the one you've got to be thinking of. The rate of fistula is somewhere between 6 to 14 percent, and the mortality rate may be as high as 4 percent if you have a pancreatic fistula. So this is a critical diagnosis, and I'll tell you, talking with our surgeons, this is the one they're always most, the most worried about. Now, who gets a pancreatic fistula? Now, some of it has to do with surgical technique, but there are a number of risk factors, including having a relatively small pancreatic duct, soft pancreatic parenchyma, or having intra lots of intraoperative blood loss. And there's also an association with other complications. So if you have a pancreatic fistula, you're more likely to have sepsis, pancreatitis, form an abscess, hemorrhage, or develop delayed gastric emptying. So this is a big deal, right? If you end up with a pancreatic fistula, the odds are that you run the risk of developing other major complications, and you're much more likely to have a poor clinical outcome. As I mentioned, this is primarily a clinical diagnosis based on your drain amylase levels, but any time in the immediate postoperative setting where you see a focal fluid collection, focal blood, or ectopic gas immediately adjacent to the pancreatic jejunostomy, you have to worry about the possibility of a leak. And especially if you can trace that fluid or gas directly in contiguity with the pancreatic duct or the anastomotic suture line. So here's an example. This is a patient who came to us with a known diagnosis of a pancreatic fistula. They had a drain amylase level of close to 5,000, a serum amylase of 26. So as I mentioned, clinically, you can make the diagnosis of a pancreatic fistula based on the drain amylase alone. But notice that the CT scan is classic for a leak. There's a focal fluid collection immediately adjacent to the pancreatic or jejunal anastomosis. There's ectopic gas. We're not seeing the tiny amounts of free fluid adjacent to the pancreatic bed that 
I said was normal earlier. This is a large amount of fluid, a discrete fluid collection, lots of ectopic gas, all of which are very close to the pancreatic adrenal anastomosis. Notice that the fluid collection is actually directly invaginating into the anastomosis itself. This is clearly a leak, and you can see in the second image that they put in a surgical drain, or a percutaneous drain. Here's another example. Again, you can see that there is a focal fluid collection directly extending into the pancreatic jejunal anastomosis. If you see that in the immediate postoperative setting, that is a leak until proven otherwise, and you need to call the surgeon and make sure that they have looked at drain amylase levels to confirm the diagnosis. Now, most cases today, if you develop a pancreatic fistula, the patient is going to be treated conservatively. They're going to put in a percutaneous drain to kind of deal with the fluid collection, but the patient typically is not going to go directly to the operating room. The only instance where you might potentially precipitate the patient going back to the OR is if you see signs of massive anastomotic dehiscence, so large free air, large fluid collections, something that makes you suspect that the anastomosis is completely broken down, and typically this is not a clinical dilemma, right? When you have massive anast anastomotic dehiscence at the pancreatic jejunostomy, these patients are really sick, they're in the ICU, they're on the verge of dying. So this is not usually going to be uh, some kind of a dilemma for the surgeons to deal with. Now, pancreatic jejunal leaks are by far the most common leaks that we deal with in clinical practice, right? Yes, you can rarely end up with leaks at the gastrojejunostomy or at the biliary enteric anastomosis, but honestly, they're pretty rare. Gastrojejunostomy leaks in particular are extraordinarily rare, right? I've only seen, I think, one or two over the last few years, and almost always these are secondary to major technical failures of surgery, and it goes without saying that this is a big deal, almost always associated with major morbidity and mortality, and a gastrojejunostomy leak typically will require them to go back in to do operative intervention. Now, bile leaks, or biliary enteric anastomotic leaks, are much less common than pancreatic fistula, but certainly much more common than a gastrojejunostomy leak. Again, typically due to technical failure of surgery, you're going to make this diagnosis when you see a focal fluid collection or a large amount of free fluid directly adjacent to the biliary enteric anastomosis. Remember, the location of a fluid collection can be very use helpful in terms of figuring out where the patient has a leak. If you see a fluid collection adjacent to the pancreatic jejunostomy, it's most likely a pancreatic fistula or a pancreatic jejunal leak. On the other hand, if you see a fluid collection in the right upper quadrant near the hepatic jejunostomy, you have to worry that it's probably a bile leak from the hepatic jejunostomy. If you're not sure, hepatobiliary scintigraphy or nuclear medicine studies can be very helpful in terms of defining whether the patient truly does have a leak from the biliary enteric anastomosis. Now, Pancreatic fistula is the most important complication. I would say the second most important complication that we deal with or see as radiologists is going to be postoperative hemorrhage. Now, if you see enough postoperative Whipple cases, you will see postoperative hemorrhages. And I think a lot of people just aren't aware that this is a major well-known complication of the Whipple procedure, but, but it is. And even though it's relatively rare, it does occur in up to about 4% of patients, and when it does occur, it's associated with quite significant mortality rates, perhaps as high as about 40%. Now, postoperative hemorrhage after the Whipple procedure typically is extraluminal, so outside of the bowel, two-thirds of cases, but can be intraluminal as well, so can occur within the gastric remnant or the right upper quadrant small bowel. Now, the initial presence of blood clinically, is, or the, or clinically or on a CT scan, is termed a sentinel bleed. So the first time you bleed, you have to be urgently worked up, as that bleeding implies that you either have A, structural vascular abnormality, or B, an anastomotic dehiscence. But either way, that bleed really heralds the fact that you have something really bad going on, and you really need to be worked up to figure out what it is. Now, postoperative hemorrhage can be broadly defined as, into two, or broadly divided into two types. There is early postoperative hemorrhage that occurs in the first 24 hours after surgery, and it's almost always going to be bleeding from the GDA stump, typically as a result of inadequate ligation during surgery. On the other hand, late postoperative hemorrhage tends to occur a few days later, usually after five days, and by this point you're dealing with a real structural abnormality of the vasculature. So it could be an erosion, a pseudoaneurysm, but again, it's typically going to be from the GDA stump, either active erosion with extravasation or pseudoaneurysm. Now, these late postoperative bleeds have a very high association with anastomotic breakdown, and again, it goes without saying, associated with very high morbidity and mortality. 
So here's a patient uh, immediately after the Whipple procedure. You can see that there's a big bleed. Notice the presence of active extravasation. This patient actually ended up going directly to angio for embolization. Here's another example. This patient is about, I think, six days after surgery. You can see there's a big hematoma surrounding the pancreatic bed. Now, as I mentioned before, when you have late post-Whipple bleeds, there tends to be an underlying vascular abnormality, a structural abnormality. And in this case, you can see that there's a large uh, pseudoaneurysm of the splenic artery. Now, this is one of the reasons why I am a strong believer you've got to get arterial phase images routinely in patients who've had a prior Whipple. You are, I'm going to promise you, will miss small pseudoaneurysms if you're just dealing with a venous phase. Now, in most cases, the arterial phase may not help you, but in that one in a hundred case where you're dealing with a large bleed and you want to find that subtle pseudoaneurysm or active extravasation, you will be thankful that you're routinely acquiring the arterial phase images as part of your protocol. Here's another example. This patient had a large bleed adjacent to the surgical bed a few days after the Whipple procedure and noticed that there's a pseudoaneurysm on the angio arising from the inferior pancreatic or duodenal artery. Here's another example. Again, large bleed, active extravasation from the GDA stump. You can see this layering, active extravasation. This patient is, I think, immediately post-op, and so as you'd expect, it's usually going to represent bleeding from the GDA stump. As I mentioned earlier, two-thirds of cases are intraluminal, but I've seen plenty of examples where patients have post-operative Whipple bleeds where it's intraluminal, classically either the gastric remnant or the right upper quadrant small bowel. Here's an example. This patient was having massive GI bleeding after surgery, and you can see that there's lots of blood distending these right upper quadrant jejunal loops, and ostensibly this bleeding has something to do with problems in the vasculature related to the way in which the surgery was done. Now, those are probably the two most important complications in the acute setting. A common complication that I think we tend to miss, or at least underdiagnose on CT, is postoperative pancreatitis. And this is actually quite a difficult diagnosis because how do you know if you're dealing with pancreatitis or alternatively just postoperative inflammatory change? So even though this is pretty common, probably in about a third of all cases, I'd say that we very rarely ever make this diagnosis because we just write it off as being postoperative. That being said, if you see a disproportionate amount of inflammation around the pancreatic remnant, rather than diffusely in the surgical bed, and especially when you see a disproportionate amount of fluid tracking from the pancreas along the pararenal spaces, you should at least think about the possibility of postoperative pancreatitis. Now, another major complication that you have to be looking for when you're dealing with these post-operative cases is portomesenteric venous thrombosis. And this has actually become more and more of a problem as surgeons are doing all kinds of complex venous reconstructions to treat patients who at one point were considered unresectable because of tumoral involvement. It goes without saying that you start doing more venous interposition grafts, jump grafts, so on and so forth, that your risk of venous thrombosis goes up considerably. So if you look at the traditional literature, it says that 17% of patients with a Whipple procedure develop venous thrombosis. And I'd say that's probably an underestimate, given that we've only in the last few years started seeing these more and more complex venous reconstructions. Now, in most cases, patients with portomesenteric venous thrombosis will be treated with systemic anticoagulation, but in the immediate postoperative setting, surgical thrombectomy is theoretically an option. Now, this is a diagnosis that you really shouldn't miss, provided that you take the time to actually look at the vasculature in every postoperative case. This has to be a part of your standard search algorithm. Every time I look at a post-Whipple, I'm looking at the portal vein, looking at the confluence, looking at the SMV. And if, as long as you look at those vessels, you're not going to miss this diagnosis. This is pretty obvious, right? Portal vein thrombosis, not a difficult diagnosis, provided that you actually take the time to look at the portal vein. Similarly, SMV thrombosis, not difficult. Take the time to look at the vessel. Use the coronal reconstructions when you're looking at the SMV, and you won't miss this diagnosis. Now, a relatively rare complication um, is hepatic infarction. But this is something that you'll see every once in a while. Um, usually in patients who not only have some kind of surgical injury to the vessel, but also an underlying abnormality in the mesenteric arterial vasculature. And the reason for that is because the liver has a dual blood supply via the hepatic artery and the portal vein, just having a single abnormality or a single vessel involved usually isn't enough to give you an infarct. So typically you have to have an underlying abnormality in the arterial vasculature and then something that pushes you over the edge, whether it's an arterial thrombosis or portal venous clot, so, so on and so forth. So always these patients will have 
you know, severe atherosclerotic disease, median arcuate ligament syndrome, FMD, vasculitis, so on and so forth. And then the surgery and some complication associated with the surgery typically pushes them over the top. Now, I'd say the most common is some kind of an injury to either the hepatic artery or the celiac artery during surgical resection or dissection, and that tends to be especially problematic when you have a larger tumor that's surrounding multiple vessels. And as you can imagine, as we're resecting more and more tumors that do have underlying vascular involvement, this is increasingly common. Now, one situation where I've seen this happen, actually the, the most common situation where I've seen this happen, is where the presence of a replaced or accessory right hepatic artery wasn't noted on the preoperative scan, wasn't noted at surgery, it was inadvertently sacrificed during the procedure, and the patient ends up with a right hepatic lobe infarct. Now, this is what you don't want happening, right? This patient had a large right hepatic lobe infarct. They actually had, I, I believe, a, right hepatic, a, re, a replaced right hepatic artery that wasn't noted at surgery or on preoperative imaging. And that infarct has gone on to develop into a biloma. The biloma got super infected. And now you've got a big infected infarct or infected liver abscess. Now, what's the most common complication in, in the postoperative setting? And it's actually something that we don't think of as a big deal. And, Honestly, we don't tend to make this diagnosis a lot on imaging, but it's quite common, and that's delayed gastric emptying, which affects probably about 50% of patients uh, who have undergone a Whipple procedure. No one knows why it happens, right? It may be because of some kind of localized disturbance of the autonomic innervation of the stomach near the operative bed, but that's just a guess. No one really has a good idea why it happens, but we do know that it tends to be more common in patients who have other postoperative complications abscess, fistula, intraoperative blood loss, and so on and so forth. Now, in most cases, it's going to be a tough diagnosis to make on a CT scan, and honestly, it's primarily a clinical diagnosis. The surgeons define this as a patient who has prolonged need for a nasogastric tube. So basically, they take the NG tube out, the patient can't tolerate it, they have to put the NG tube back down, that is, quote-unquote, delayed gastric emptying. But there are some features on a CT scan that can help you at least suggest a diagnosis. So if you see a massively distended stomach with lots of retained ingested material, food particulate material, then you're probably dealing with a patient who has delayed gastric emptying. Now, honestly, the diagnosis is usually going to be obvious to the surgeons clinically. CT isn't really critical for this diagnosis. But it's, I think, something good for the radiologist to understand as to why they're seeing a distended stomach after the Whipple. Now, in most cases, it has to do with the underlying autonomic innervation, but in the immediate postoperative period, you can end up with a dilated stomach as a result of edema uh, and thickening at the gastrojejunal anastomosis, as in this case. But in most instances where you have discrete edema at the anastomosis resulting in some form of partial obstruction, that should resolve over time as the edema goes away. Now, in the chronic setting, one of the complications you have to think about is anastomotic stricture, and this is actually a pretty common delayed complication, both at the hepaticojejunostomy and to a lesser extent at the pancreaticojejunostomy. Now, the timelines or the time frames in which you're going to be looking for these anastomotic strictures is, I think, important to know. Pancreaticojejunal strictures tend to occur pretty early, right? And so the median time to diagnosis is three months. So this is something you're going to see on their immediate postoperative follow-up or maybe a couple of follow-ups down the line. On the other hand, hepaticojejunostomy strictures take a little longer to develop, 18 months, 2 years. So this is something you're going to be looking at years down the line, potentially, and so not something you're going to see in the immediate uh, you know, first follow-up or second follow-up. Now, the key when you're looking for anastomotic strictures is to pay careful attention to the size of both the pancreatic and bile ducts pancreatic duct and the bile ducts. So in every study, th this is something that goes into my dictation in the body of the report. I talk about whether the pancreatic duct is stable in size, is it large? If so, has it changed? Same thing with the biliary tree. Is there new or in increasing biliary ductal dilatation? Now, if I see a change in size of either the biliary tree or the pancreatic duct, the first thing I'm going to look for is the presence of a new occult obstructing tumor, right? That's the thing you don't want to miss. You don't want to miss the fact that their pancreatic duct is dilated because they've developed recurrent tumor involving the anastomosis. But if you don't see tumor, then most likely you're dealing with a benign stricture and that's something that can be, in most instances, treated non-operatively. And nowadays, patients are typically going to be treated with balloon dilatation. Now, here's an example where I think it'd be very easy to just say, well, the patient has a dilated pancreatic duct, probably have a stricture, right? This is actually new. So the patient had a scan, I think, 
three months prior looked, which looked normal. Now they've got a moderately dilated pancreatic duct. But notice that this pancreatic duct, even though dilated, does not extend all the way to the pancreatic jejunal anastomosis. It actually stops proximal to the anastomosis. And if you look carefully, especially in the image in the bottom right, there is this subtle nodular focus of hypodensity. Remember what I said earlier. Anytime you see an increased size of the pancreatic duct or the common bile or the, or the biliary tree, you need to rule out the presence of an occult obstructing tumor. And in this case, there was a subtle sub-centimeter obstructing lesion at the pancreatic adjugenostomy, and that was confirmed based on endoscopic ultrasound. So in summary, hopefully I've given you again a sense for why proper CT technique is critical. Now, I will admit, in most cases, as long as you have good venous phase images, you're going to be able to identify most complications. But as I've shown you, postoperative bleeding is one of the most feared complications of the Whipple procedure. And if you don't have arterial phase imaging, you potentially could miss active extravasation or a structural vascular anomaly, such as a pseudoaneurysm, that potentially could cause significant morbidity and mortality. Second, understand what's normal. I'd say some of the biggest mistakes I've seen after a Whipple procedure in terms of interpretation have been when people have confused normal findings for pathology or vice versa. They saw something that was clearly abnormal, but they figured, well, it probably is just normal post-op. If you understand what normal looks like, you're going to be in a much better position to identify appropriately those complications that may be life-threatening. Finally, I really believe in taking an algorithmic approach when I'm looking at these post-operative cases. I look at every one of these cases the same way every single time. I look at each of the anastomoses, and then I look for all of the complications that I talked about earlier. Provided that you look at the anatomy adequately and you look carefully for the complications I talked about, you're not going to miss anything major that could lead to significant patient morbidity and mortality. So that's all I have. Thanks again. I'll see you guys later.